Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. Primrose ZJB Ma and I create content about research, career development and mindfulness. In today's episode, I'm going to be speaking to you about thinking about alternative career pathways to academia. I speak to you about this topic both as a person who has thought about what else I can do with my PhD outside academia and also as a person who is a proponent for always thinking about alternative pathways and different ways to grow as a career-minded person. Also, I just think that being young means that time is also on our side in terms of recrafting our career pathways and being creative about how we develop ourselves as thinkers, as knowledge producers, as well as educators. Because I believe also that educating people doesn't require one to stay within academia. So the first point I have down here is why consider an alternative to academia in the first place? You might be thinking, like, what's wrong with academia? Why would Primrose talk about something else besides academics? Well, the reality is that academia is not for everyone. So you might realize that academia is just not for you. People realize this at different stages in their pathways. It could be during your honors, your undergraduate, your master's, or even your PhD, or when you're doing a postdoctoral research fellowship, which is quite late, but you know, there's always a room to pivot and you're already skilled and amazing and you can do amazing things elsewhere. So academia might not be for you by design in terms of the way that it is structured in terms of working hours, what is required of you in terms of teaching, in terms of research demands, and the requirement to research and publish in particular formats as a journal, as a book, as a book chapter. It might not be for you in terms of the internal politics within the institution where you are currently based and you just want to be in a healthier workspace for your sanity and your health long term. So sometimes, of course, the alternative is to go to another institution. But if that alternative is not there, then, of course, maybe academia is not for you right now. And you might have to pivot and go elsewhere with your amazing research or teaching skills. So also sometimes academia is just not for you full stop. You realize that you appreciate having a degree and all these qualifications and you appreciate the time you spent in the academy, but realize that you want to be working in the field as a researcher, doing other things maybe like that are not even related to your degree. So obviously that one is a sure sign that you should leave and find an alternative career to academia. People often make this joke about people who have PhDs who end up owning bakeries. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that as long as there's passion and as long as you're going to get profit out of it. You know, also I think it's important because we're adults and we need to make money. So you can realize that academia is and did not for you. And I think that sometimes also you might want an alternative because you want to learn more in other spaces and learning more might require you to fully immerse yourself elsewhere. So for example, as an engineer, you might want to be working in industry as opposed to working in a university. As someone who is in the arts, you might actually want to immerse yourself as a performer, as an actor, as a producer, or any other roles as opposed to actually working within academia as a lecturer or as a tutor or teaching assistant. And then in my case, right, I've been thinking a lot about how much of the work that I do requires in-depth insider information from working in spaces such as in corporate spaces like banks, working in international organizations such as the United Nations, working in government or even working with a think tank or civil society organization. And although I do have networks within those spaces, I do not get to highly appreciate what it means to work in those sectors and to work with people on the ground because of the time that I've had to dedicate to academia and also because of the time that I've had to dedicate to thinking and writing like an academic as opposed to thinking and writing in other ways. Um, so... You might be wondering why I am posing this question to myself in terms of what's wrong with academia, why consider an alternative. One of the reasons the reality is that there are very few job openings in academia, so the competition is stiff. And I think since 
time, I don't know, immemorial. We're living in a time where there are more PhD graduates than ever before. And some sectors or, you know, departments are saturated. I'm in political studies, the social sciences. I think there's an overrepresentation of professors and academics in many institutions, particularly maybe institutions that I would want to find myself in. So I have to think deeply about if I don't get accepted or if I don't get in there, you know, in a position that is higher than a postdoctoral research fellow, then I must look elsewhere and elsewhere might look like outside academia. So I think the second one, you know, after thinking about why you should consider an alternative to academia is pick a niche. What are you going to do? As a social science major, I think for me, I think some of the alternatives are working for a think tank, civil society organization, non-government organizations, faith-based organizations, you know, banks maybe, risk consultancy firms, future forecasting organizations, government where I've worked before in foreign affairs, and maybe establishing my own thing. Perhaps also maybe political journalism might not be a bad idea, although it's an area that I've often said that I, I don't want to work in. So I think you need to pick a niche because you are better off doing so than trying to become a generalist and learning everything from scratch. Um, so whilst you're still in academia and realizing bit by bit that it's not for you in the long run or in the short run, you have to think deeply about where you can immerse yourself. So you can do this by doing internships whilst you're still in academia, whether pursuing your degree or your postdoc. You can also do this maybe if you attend workshops, conferences, expos, whatever the case may be, that are linked to the type of organization that you want to venture into. You can also, for example, if you want to become a political journalist, I think one of the easiest ways is to actually churn out a lot of opinion pieces, feature articles, or maybe like multimedia projects, like a documentary or a podcast series that resonates with the sector you want to join. And people can actually realize that, you know what, you're a person to work with. I'm saying this because academics are often seen as people that are stuck up, super focused on theories and concepts and love using big words and taking long to do research because we're so used to writing pieces and dissertations and waiting on papers to go under review and like rewrite and write again and whatnot. But these other sectors might have a different set of skills that you might have to develop and show proof that you are capable of doing. And one thing I want to say is when you pick a niche, right, that you want to pivot to, realize that you might have to go in there at a very low level, which is why I mentioned, for example, internships. For example, you could have to start off by doing a United Nations internship. You've never worked there. You know, you might have some skills which resonate with what they need from a researcher, but there's so much more that you need to learn. So you might have to go there and start from a lower level. And that's something I've always been open to embracing as long as you've got a timeline. For me, I think six months is the maximum limit you should be doing any internship or volunteer kind of work in a sector that you want to join. Because first of all, there's bills to be paid. And secondly, you are a fast learner guaranteed. I have tried this and I know for sure. All right. So after thinking about why consider an alternative pathway and thinking about a niche that you want to pick, I think the third one is to leverage your strengths. I don't know a lot in terms of this, in terms of um, examples from other people. So I would draw on my personal experience, which is something that I recently began, uh, perhaps let's say from the beginning of this year, 2024. So I've realized that the skills and strengths that I can leverage are in critical thinking and reading as well as analysis. So while I'm well-versed in writing academically, incorporating theories and concepts, those are elements I might have to do away with if I'm working in an international organization or a think tank or a community-based organization. So for me, what I've realized is in order to show that the same skills I have demonstrated in academia can yield tangible results outside academia, I have worked as a rapporteur at conferences and other events where my main task is to draft a concept note for the event, attend the events, collate findings from different speakers and different panelists, and to be able to craft a report 
that speaks back to the concept note to say this is what we set out to do these were the outcomes of the speeches or the debates that happened during the conference or during the seminar and in line with our strategic plan as an organization this is what i propose we do moving forward so the tangible results have been, you know, reports that are authored by myself, reports that I co-authored with other rapporteurs to also show that I'm able to collaborate with others outside academia. And also besides reports to be able to be flexible enough to communicate research outcomes or listening outcomes in other forms, for example, through media articles, through PowerPoint presentations and boardrooms, through speaking engagements in the media, but also with professionals, right? To be able to report back in meetings with multiple stakeholders and to also be able to facilitate dialogues on the way forward when it comes to whatever was said out as objectives for the particular event that just ended. So it's very important to have those tangibles that you can cite because your CV cannot continue to just have your academic articles, to just have your academic speaking engagements. You need to show that in line with your willingness to pivot, you have been doing some work. Volunteering can literally look like going to an event and doing their social media posts. You know, most people when they're hosting events, they love to love tweet um, live X. That sounds weird. Yes. But to live tweet or maybe to like post reflections on the event on LinkedIn and Facebook, whatever platforms resonate the best with that particular organization. And that may do wonders for you because you're showing that you're bringing a skill set that increases their visibility. The better if you've got a large following. I've been thinking about ways that I can actually leverage the fact that I've got almost 10,000 followers on LinkedIn and about 1,500 followers on YouTube. And so that might actually be, you know, one of the areas of interest for an organization that wants to work with me. So as I said earlier, again, I'm not well versed when it comes to leveraging your strengths, but you as an individual can actually sit down and think about what are my strengths and how do they fit into the niche area that I want to get into. Now, the next point addresses the reality that your strengths might actually not fit perfectly even if you have transferable skills and so you need to think about developing and using new skills in line of course with the area that you wish to pivot towards so for me what i was thinking was i could improve my skills when it comes to legal analysis because most of the projects i'd like to work on are focused on human rights and human rights of course are based on human rights law, international human rights law. So am I going to take a course on that? Am I going to do a second master's? Of course not um, a second master's, but maybe it's courses that help me attending workshops, attending seminars, webinars, whatever it is that can sharpen my skills in legal analysis and actually writing papers that demonstrate that I have attempted to do an analysis of legal documents or legal developments. Of course, these have to be aligned with a particular area that is linked to the organization. So if it's a human rights organization that focuses on gender, showing that I can do legal analysis in line with, you know, gender and transformation. If it is legal analysis in relation to international trade law, then obviously I have to demonstrate the same. You can also develop new skills in journalism, you know, new skills in statistics and economic thought, new skills in videography or photography, new skills in project management or monitoring and evaluation. I think for me right now, all these skills that I've proposed are very much linked to anyone who is in the social sciences because that's what I'm more familiar with. Some skills that I think are very important to develop right now are in coding. People speak about it a lot. Although I see contradicting views online, whether like through YouTube videos or people writing their opinions on whether it is actually valuable to be able to code, to be able to do quantitative data analysis. So that's why I say do your research, find your niche, link it to your strengths, and also now see what else you need to add. You can do this by looking at job descriptions. So I've got a list of jobs that I would really want to work in but i've realized that i don't have the complete skill set i don't discard those job descriptions i keep them on my laptop i look at them every now and again i tick what skills i've gained and also like make sure that i indicate the areas of growth or potential that i actually need to work towards 
So moving on to the next point, expand your networks. I cannot overstress this. In many ways, people get opportunities because they responded to a job advert. But I've realized that who you know really matters. And if you're not privileged enough to know peers who are in the alternative to academia, then you have to do the work. LinkedIn is a good place to start. Look up, you know, gurus in their industries or sectors. Follow them. Engage with the work they do. What projects are they working on? Do they have any events coming up soon? Are you able to attend online or maybe in person? Communicate with the people via DM if you've got something to offer in terms of like a partnership you can work with them on or if you want to show them the work that you have. For example, if you're a creative and it matches with their interests. Beyond LinkedIn, I think it's okay to use Instagram because some people have been using social media like Instagram to actually demonstrate their work as well. I think a lot of medical doctors do this. I've seen research consultants doing the same as well. I'm not too sure about TikTok, but you never know. Look there as well in case there's someone you might be able to DM and actually partner with and work with. Facebook, I guess, works as well. That depends on the sector again. And then WhatsApp groups. I am part of WhatsApp groups that are linked to a wide range of opportunities for postdocs. And I really think I would benefit by being in WhatsApp groups for NGOs, community-based organizations or international organizations, because oftentimes people also share opportunities there. People also look for contacts within those spaces to be like, I'm looking for someone to work with on a project on this, this and that. And then the next thing, you know what? You've got the deal. So in addition to social media, I think social spaces that are real and physical are important. The proposals that I have here are not what you might be expecting. I have put down hiking, I've put down running, I've put down golf. Golf because I hear about it, not because of like personal experiences. I've put down hiking because I belong to a group of like a diverse set of young people who are professionals in different sectors. And trust me, you will run out of time speaking about the beauty of God's granger, the sunrise today, the beauty of the mountains, the lush green grass, and the beautiful animals you're seeing on the plains. And there is an opportunity to actually chat about work without, of course, like speaking about areas that are sensitive. Just speaking about what happens in your sector, you know, how does one pivot into that sector or how do you work with people that come out from academia, all of that, you know. Sometimes you might actually just speak about the work you've done yourself if you think that it speaks to a certain person's interest. So I think it's also good to just have conversations to also know what other people are doing. So you could actually just be engaging with people, not because you hope that there will be your link to the next opportunity, but because they could actually give you ideas about what else you can do with life. Running groups, I'm not so sure because, you know, most of the time people are super competitive and they're trying to finish the distances, but there's usually people that settle down social time over coffee or over a meal post run or something else, or they do like an end of year event for their running club and people actually get to talk, you know, before or after the event. So, Always find time to engage with other people. And I hate the, so what do you do question, but I've come to realize that that question is actually very important and crucial. And in a time when I feel that, you know, I'm not permanently employed, I've been very shy to be like, oh yeah, I'm a research fellow, but the research fellowship is for two years. I've begun to embrace the reality that I can actually put myself forward as, oh yeah, I'm a researcher, I'm a policy analyst, you know, I'm based in political studies, but I'm able to do research in this, 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 and other area. And it has opened up spaces for so many more conversations. Parties count, I guess weddings too, I'm not sure about funerals, but make sure that you make time to engage with people in different social spaces. The third one I have is, of course, the obvious one, professional settings. Go to conferences, go to expos, go to workshops, go to seminars, network within those areas. For me, oftentimes, I find it to be a bit challenging when it comes to business forums and expos because people are very niche in their approach. Like if I attend right now an expo on tech, if you're not already working in a company or a startup 
Oftentimes, you realize that when you're trying to network with people, they don't give you much of their time. But nevertheless, try. Speak to them about your interests. Hear more about their interests. You could literally attend one event for listening. And then the next event for the sake of engagement. And then for the next event, you could literally just go there so that you can get a better understanding of what other people are doing in their field of work. Also take the time to go to spaces to present so that people know who you are and what you're all about. Also, I spoke about being a rapporteur for me. It really helps because I'm under no pressure to be speaking at the event. I'm there to listen, take it all in. I've got a register of who's attending. I'm listening critically. I can engage with them thereafter about what they were speaking about. And that gives us room to actually network further beyond the particular event. I think networking requires its own video. So if you think that I should do a video on networking, I'm hoping you've watched till this stage. Please just put down the word networking in the comment section or otherwise just email me at pzjbimha at gmail.com, pzjbima at gmail.com. So I've spoken about why consider an alternative to academia. That's point number one. I spoke about picking a niche. I spoke about leveraging your strength. I spoke about developing a new skill set that is relevant for the new sector. I spoke about expanding your networks. That's number five. And now number six. Who is the CEO of your life? No, it's not you. God. So I understand that people have different spiritual beliefs. Personally, I am a Christian and I surrender all to God. God has dominion over us and has dominion over the people that have the resources and opportunities that we seek. Pray to him fervently. Take everything to God in prayer, deliberately so, you know. Pray for guidance, pray for discernment, and pray for grace. Other people say they believe in luck. For me, I don't think luck exists. I think it's all God's grace. You know, when you get an opportunity, when you least expect it, or when imposter syndrome is high, and you're like, oh my goodness, this cannot be me, you know. Also pray for God to put you in the right place at the right time and for you to meet the right people and for the right projects to also come your way so that you can flourish and exhibit your strengths. And also so that those projects can be projects that pay well. Money matters a lot, guys. I'm an old woman and I need money because I need money to survive and also to cater for a whole lot of expenses and to think about my pension, you know, as I grow older. So... It's very important. It's very important. I think, you know, I can even do a whole episode also on what it means to take everything to God in prayer. I've prayed to God about visa outcomes for them to be expedited and God has seen me through. I've prayed to God about entering into spaces where, you know, they typically don't take a black woman, young black woman, young black foreign woman, and it has happened for me. I've prayed to God to help me to have seniors who actually advocate for my work and my interests in, you know, big rooms that I'm not invited to. So it's very important. And I have seen that it actually does work. And, and I'm really grateful for God's grace in that regard. So moving on to the seventh point, which is the last one for today, is always aim for independence. I think this one also requires its own video. I've been doing a lot of thinking, I guess, because it's important, yes, to align yourself with organizations. I've always wanted to work for the UN. I know people that are super enthusiastic about working for big media companies, big law firms, big accounting firm, big think tanks, whatever you call it. And it's important. But I think that we need to always cater for potential heartbreaks. Because for me, for example, for the longest time, I'm not yet in the organization I would ideally want to be in. I'm not working for the United Nations University. I'm not working for the UN in any capacity. But I've got a whole set of experiences that are amazing. And I don't want to feel mellow and feel like I haven't done much with my life simply because I haven't arrived in those particular areas yet. And also what happens if I don't arrive there? Does that mean I'm not going to be amazing? No. So I think for me, my ultimate aim is to be a globally acclaimed, excellent policy analyst, policy researcher and, you know, consultant, thought leader, knowledge producer, professor, and, 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 and so much more. 
So, and I don't think that requires me to have the label of an organization next to me, although that would be nice. So I think it's also important for you to think in that way. It also helps you so that you give yourself the opportunity to work with organizations that you would otherwise not apply to because you don't think that they are aligned with your goals. Of course, always pray to God and remind him of where you want to be, but also trust him for the direction that he's going to give to you. So with those few words, this is it for this weekend. I apologize for not releasing this video on the 29th of September as promised. A lot was going on. A girl was tired, but a girl is back. So yeah, I look forward to many more engagements in the month of October. I wish you a pleasant last quarter of 2024 and it's goodbye for now.